we're, we're a little bit of update how things are going to go on. I think moving forward, um, we're coming to the end, I think, of the massive quarantine time, and my schedule is going to be moving around. And I've already mentioned this a little bit. My thinking is we'll probably do all week next week, which would be um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We're taking, all right, keeping Wednesday off. And then the next week, we'll start doing every week on Mondays at 11.30. Give me, a, give me a reason to get out of bed every week, and we'll just keep the Revelation study going uh, for for that whole time frame. Um, so that's going on. I also realized, yet, watch, as I was um, downloading yesterday's video, I'm starting to move the videos over to YouTube so they're easier to access and everything. So I'm downloading them, editing them slightly, and sit, putting up on YouTube. And, hey, my sister's here. It's family. All right, so anyway, um, the... I realized that sometime in the next week or two, I'm going to have to trim the quarantine beard because I, I did, when I see it every day, I don't realize. And I looked at the video yesterday. I was like, wow, that thing's getting big. So anyway, um, unfortunately, I have to be trimming that down to, to more going out in public size. So today, we're, let's get going. So today we're in the, um, we have to wait till Tim Johnson comes in because when Tim shows up, he's my fact checker. And I ask him the questions. I say, Where, what's this mean? He looks it up real fast and pops it up for me. So I have to have Tim in the room for, for that purpose. So anyway, today we're going to be looking at the church in Philadelphia. Okay, so all the ones, from, all my Philadelphia fans and friends, I mean, kind of be looking at that. And this is the, 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 the city of Philadelphia was, you know, probably named after this city. But really... Um, this city wasn't a major deal. This was not the, the the huge metropolis that Ephesus was and all those kind of places. It was the youngest of the cities. It was one of the smallest. And there was a, a good reason for that. They had all kinds of trouble growing as a city because they sat right on a fault line. And every time they would build something, an earthquake would knock it over. And also, if you've got a choice of living in a city or staying in a city during an earthquake, or running away, what are you going to do? You know, everything's made of stone and goes straight up. You know, well, I'm going to go out in the fields. Now, the reason it was a city, in spite of the fact that it had all the earthquakes and all the other negatives going on all the time, was that um, the farmland was amazing. It was they had great farmland. They're known known for their vineyards at that time. The farmland's still amazing. This area in Turkey, there's a new town sitting there, a different named town. But back then it was known for its um, vineyards. Now, um, if you go there now, they they have a ra they they grow they grow grapes that turn into raisins. Their raisins are amazing. There's a lot of fresh fruit. Sounds like a really cool place to visit as long as you don't get in an earthquake because those are happening. Now, because of that, they were, because of the earthquakes and they wanted to grow, they were always trying to suck up to Rome. They were just like, okay, we have to be important somehow. So they'd suck up to Rome, and a couple times they even tried to change their name. One time they trained, tried to change it to, to Neo um, Caesarea, Neo Caesarea, New Caesarville, okay? Because <laughs> they were trying to suck up, but it never worked out for them. Matter of fact, in um, AD 95, which is about the time this is written, so I don't know whether this was written before or after, but around that time, the emperor actually made throughout the empire, they had to cut down half their vineyards. And this place was known for its vineyards. Now, he was probably trying to get them to grow grain. They needed, they needed bread more than they needed wine. And so he was pushing that. Oh, hi, Gail. <laughs> I just catch names at random and say hi once in a while. Don't if I if I miss your name, it just means I, I was looking down when it scrolled past me. Um, so anyway, that that's Philadelphia, a place that has great, um, great farmland, tons and tons of vineyards and all that stuff going on, but could never be a major city because earthquakes made it was too unstable and nobody wanted to live in the city walls. They all wanted to live out on their farms. So anyway, so let's just work through. We're in Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13, and we're just going to read this through, and the stuff we talked about with the city, that's going to come back, okay? So, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. Now, God, of course, Jesus is holy. He is true. I, I, I point that out a lot, that in, in our day we forget that part, that God is truth. And so anything that we say that is untrue is against God's nature. So he's holy and he's true. He's separate, he's perfect, he's holy and true. And then it says he holds the key of David. Now, um, keys are always important. I mean, you know, 
everybody, you have keys to your house, you have keys to everything important. And if you lose the keys, that's imp that's a big deal. But he's basically quoting Isaiah 2, 22, 20, 22, 22, which is talking about a successor to David's throne and saying that this successor is going to have the authority, at the time was talking about somebody back then, but now it would apply to Jesus, who had the authority to choose who got in and who got out, or who didn't get in, to the kingdom of, to the Jewish kingdom, the kingdom of God in, in their way of looking at it, okay? And so what he's saying is, Jesus is the one who holds the key of David, the one who can get in or can't get in to God's kingdom, okay? So that's a pretty important thing. So Jesus has the keys, and if he, you, if he lets you in, you're in, and if he doesn't let you in, you ain't in, okay? Does that make sense? And that, that's a very important thing. And then he puts it, very next phrase, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one could open. Now, let me go ahead and tell you, this will show up in a little bit more in a, in a minute, but in Christians and Jews at this time, there's, there's this back and forth. And in most cities, there's a synagogue. In some places, the synagogue was very powerful and very hostile to Christians. Some places, it wasn't either big or it wasn't hostile. And we're going to see in a little bit that in Philadelphia, the Jewish um, synagogue people were very, very hostile to Christianity. And what, if you were a Jew, what would you say about the keys to the kingdom of David? Right. We got the keys. Okay. We are the successors of David. So we have the keys. And Jesus is saying, no, see, when I, when I did the whole cross-resurrection thing, yeah, I took the keys. Keys are mine. So I have the keys. And what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Boom. He has the door. Now, verse 8. We got to, there's a couple things that people miss on this one. I've missed it myself a lot, and I'm just learning how to understand it better. Verse 8, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Now, 21st century American, I, I see there's an open door no one can shut. What do I think? Well, what I think, what I tend to think automatically is what? Opportunity, right? That God has given the Church of Philadelphia an opportunity. But... That's not what he just said, okay? He, he didn't just say opportunity. He said, I have the keys of David. I have the key, and keys open, anybody, anybody? Doors, okay? And what he opens, no one can shut, and what he sh shuts, no one can open. So Jesus is not saying, I've given you an open door of opportunity to go out from the church into the world, although God does that. That's not the point here. The point is not an opportunity. The point is access to God. Okay, let that sink just a second. What he's saying is, I have opened the door so you, people in Philadelphia and anybody who's a Christian by, compar by con comparison, have access to me and no one can shut that door. No circumstance can shut. It makes, doesn't it make you think of Romans 8, 39? You know, Nothing's able to separate us from the love of God. That's what this is saying. This is saying, I have opened the door for you to come into my presence, to have access to me, to have communion and fellowship with me, and no one can shut that door. Isn't that kind of cool? I think that's really sweet. That God has, Jesus is saying to these people, by the way, as we can see in this group, this is an oppressed church. This is a church that has problems. This is not a successful, affluent church. This is not the church that's, ever, you know, this is not, the, this is not your, you know, I don't say mega church. That's, they didn't have that concept. This is not your powerful church. This is your powerless, almost, it seems, from a worldly perspective church. They don't have authority in the city. They don't have, they're like the city. They're not, not much power there. But God has given us access. What he opens, no one can shut. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. And by the way, he's going to continue that image that the open door is about access to him and relationship with him in the very next one. He talks about Laodicea, yeah, Laodicea, which we'll talk about on Monday. He says, this is verse 20 of the same chapter. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So we'll talk about that. Monday, but it is, again, the concept that there is the open door, and the open door is not opportunity, it's access to God. And these people, though they feel weak, have unlimited access to God. Matter of fact, here's the, the weak stuff. I know you have little strength, continuing in verse 8. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. And, and again, that's not opportunity, that's living your faith in a real way. You've kept my word, not denied my name. 
Um, it ties back, of course, to the fragility of the city. You know, you've been not, you're not that strong. But also, can I, and I have to speak to this to me, okay? Because this has been, this has been a really weird time for pastors. And I'm, I'm a very competitive guy. I'm a very driven guy. Those of you who know me know that. All the way back, you know that, okay? And here's the thing. If you guys don't recognize, that, probably don't know this, or you never really, it, you don't know it the way we know it if you're a pastor. How many people show up on Sunday is such a big part of our self-image. It really is. I mean, it shouldn't be. That's that American Christianity, that go, that gung-ho, that winning, that door of opportunity thing. And so what's happened is it's been kind of stressful and re and re and um, relaxing at the same time. The first couple of weeks with going, how many people came Sunday? I have no idea. It was online. We had like a bunch of bunch of services. Some people tuned in for 32 seconds. I don't know. We count those people. What do we do with all these? The numbers make no sense at all. I mean, we're currently, we'll do seven opportunities for people to view. We could say we're doing seven services this week if you wanted to. But we're just giving people seven opportunities. But I don't know what any of the numbers mean. I, you know, at, I'll watch the little thing in the corner, and there's an there's a eye that says how many people are viewing with you, and I'm looking at the number, willing it up because that's my nature, and that's not what he's basing their value on is how much how successful they are, okay? They are keeping his word and not denying his name. That is so much more important than all the things that I put out as reasons and measures for success. How do I judge myself? I judge myself or I should judge myself. I have kept his word and not denied his name. That's what's important. That's what matters. And boy, that's a hard lesson for a good American pastor to learn. I mean, let me just tell you, I don't know if it is a problem for you or not, but for us pastors, it's a deal breaker. And it's been, a re at first it was incredibly stressful, and then it kind of got relaxing going, you know what, I don't know who's coming Sunday, it doesn't matter, I'm going to do my best. I'm just going to lay it out there the best we can do it, and we'll just see, you know, it's up to God. And it's really been kind of huh, challenging and freeing at the same time. I don't know if that relates to you or not, but it relates to me, and I had to get it off my chest, okay? Now, the next thing we see here, this is, this is a church, a weak church as far as power, in a weak city as far as power, okay? And they're struggling, they're, they're, we'll see that they're oppressed, this church is. But the letters to the churches in Revelation have a format, there's a, you know, we've talked about it before, there's the welcome, there's all these things, there's a commendation, and the commendation which is in most of them, not all, but most of them have a commendation followed by a condemnation where Jesus says, and here's where you're screwing up. And Jesus doesn't have one in this letter. The church at Philadelphia and the church at um, Smyrna was the other one that was persecuted. The two highly persecuted weakest churches from power perspectives do not get a condemnation. Jesus has nothing negative to say about them. I think that's really important for us to get, that, that, that God is looking on such a different set of variables and values than sometimes we look at things from, and there is no condemnation to this church. None, okay? Instead, Jesus steps up. Because have you ever, um, you ever seen one kid bullying a smaller kid, and what you wanted to do was pick the, the, the bully up and just, and sort of bully him yourself a little bit, you know, just let him flip, flip the tables. Listen to verse 9. It says, I will make, because talking about this church that doesn't have a lot of power, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, but are, but th though they are not, but are liars. Remember, we had that once before, with a where the Jewish population was really strong, they were constantly turning in the Christians, they were turning them over to the authorities when they didn't do the right things, they were oppressed, the, the Jews in two of the cities were very much oppressing the church, and that's what's happening here, and he calls them both times the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> that's, just, that's just cool and cruel. Okay, now listen to this. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. I have the keys to David. I have the keys to the kingdom. I'm letting you in through the open door that I have opened and no one can shut. And these people over here are claiming they have the keys to the kingdom of David, but are in fact a synagogue of Satan. I'm going to make them grovel at your feet and let them know I love you. Oh, as some, you know, we, we anybody like revenge? Anybody, anybody out there like revenge? Yeah, I mean, I like revenge. I like the concept of revenge. And here it's like, 
yeah, Jesus is going to come in and bully the people who've bullied his children. That's such a human image and such a loving image. I know it's not, you know, God's literally not going to bully them, but it is a cool image, isn't it? You may agree it's a cool image. Okay. Um, and, and that's, by the way, that's one of the themes in the whole book of Revelation that we'll see as we go through it. Um, those who feel small are constantly reminded how big God is. I think that's a big lesson for us too, isn't it? Because what I want to do when I feel weak is find a way for me to become strong. Right? I, I, wanna, I want to strengthen myself up. I want to bulk up, as it were. When I feel weak, I want to become strong. And in Revelation, it, the constant message is, when I am weak, he is strong. Big difference. Okay? It's, not, it's walking down a, 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 a dangerous place. And recognizing how weak you are, but instead of you bulking up and gaining muscle and carrying a big gun, you're walking with somebody who's muscled up and carrying a big gun, who's muscled up more than you could ever muscle up and carrying a bigger gun than you could ever handle. So that's the picture that throughout the book of Revelation, it's not, I want you to bulk up and get a big gun, it's, I will walk with you and I am, I'm the deal. Okay, so remember that when you're feeling weak, don't don't try to make yourself feel strong. Remember how strong God is. And by the way, that is, if there is a single one big message to the whole book of Revelation, it's how big God is. You're going to see that as we go through it. You you come out of the book of Revelation going, holy cow, God's big. Okay, so that's that's that. Let's keep reading. Verse ten. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, again, not to win, not to be victorious, but to endure patiently, to just keep on moving, okay? I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, um, that trial, does that mean what as far as end times? That depends on how you interpret the book of Revelation, and we're not going to do that as we go through there very much at all, or maybe not any. We're going to let you kind of form your opinion and not tell you this is what you should believe about the book of Revelation. I want you to kind of read it clean this time. And here it says, though, God is going to help us endure patiently. We're called to endure patiently, and God is going to support us, encourage us, and help us in that. Okay. Now, verse 12. The one who is victorious from this church, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. And, of course... That goes back to the Roman history that they have as a city. Because what do they have? Earthquakes. What happens to pillars during earthquakes? They fall down. Right. And so he's saying, yeah, your pillar is strong. Now, in, Jewish, in the Jewish temple, a pillar was ornamental. They had a couple of pillars, um, big brass ones. One was named Boaz and one had another name. I'm sure Tim Johnson's looking this up right now, but I don't really need to know it. Don't worry about it. They had two big p brass pillars that stood in front of the temple and supported nothing. They were just for display. Look at how cool a pillar that is. Now, if you go to Greek and Roman temples, the pillars were the, they held the place up. If you remember the book of Judges, you've got Samson, and when Samson has been blinded at the end of his life, and they're bringing him out to show him off in this big temple, Tim, um, Samson says, hey, can I lean against one of the pillars? And he leans against the pillars so he can push and pull, push the pillars down. And when he pushes them down, the whole temple falls. Okay? So in the, the pillars were not ornamental. They were part of that. And I will make you a pillar in the temple of, a, of God, and never will you leave it. Well, a pillar is a permanent part of the temple, and it doesn't leave the temple like everybody leaves Philadelphia, th that city, every time there's an earthquake. Okay? And then it says, I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. And that's, we've seen something similar. If you've been to some churches, um, more traditional, old, sometimes older churches, they sold pews or, or somebody would buy, would pay for a pew to get put in the church and they have a plaque on the side of it in memory of this person or, or maybe a, I've seen places that have bricks with people's names on them or stained glass windows. And it's kind of like on the pillars, they would sometimes write the person of the benefactor. But I think this time that it's not the person's name, it's God's name. God wrote his name on there. And so, and remember, 
that Philadelphia tried to change their name twice to suck up to Caesar. And Jesus is saying, now, in the new city, yeah, yeah it's my name. Okay. Um, and then this next phrase, which I always like, which is coming down, the new city, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I always like to point this out to people. The way the church is, the way especially the book of Revelation writes it, the way most of them write it, heaven is a home game for us. Okay? And we don't so much go to heaven as heaven comes to us. God takes a new heaven and a new earth. He takes what we have around us. He restores it and he renews it. And heaven is here. Okay? We're not going there. It's coming here. And that's God's preparing a place for us, not to bring us to it, but to bring the place he's preparing down to us. We'll see that toward the end of Revelation of the book. Okay? Now, he then says about, about names. He's got his, his name. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven for my God, and I will write on them my new name. Now, what's the new name? Does Jesus, Jesus gets a new name? Well, let, let's, let's look at this. It's actually talked about in chapter 19 of Revelation. And this is toward the end of the book, obviously. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. And that's going to be Jesus. Yeah, His eyes are like blazing fire, and his head, on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's got a secret name. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his, his, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. Now on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus' secret name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You said, how can it be secret if you know it, Steve? Well, it's not that I don't know it. It's not that you don't know it. It's that he hasn't stepped into that name in reality yet. Okay? Jesus is, I think it, it's almost like he's, he's the prince. He's the heir apparent to the world. Because he hasn't taken possession. He hasn't actually taken control of the earth yet. So it's a secret name because it hasn't been revealed to the world that he is king of kings and lord of lords. To them, he's head of our, our religion, right? That's Jesus is the head of Christianity. That's what he is. No, Jesus is king of king and lord of lord, and people out there don't see that and don't know that until at the end of the book of Revelation, he reveals that. So his secret name is king of kings and lord of lords, and he will reveal that in the last days of the last days of this phase of earth, okay? So that's the secret name, and... He's going he's gonna to write on us. Oh, he's talking about the Church of Philadelphia. He's writing on them that new name. Okay? So they have that. It is, it, it's tattooed on them, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that we are part of God's kingdom. You see the two things that God's done here? Jesus has done two things to this weak church, this weak, powerful church. He's opened the door to the fellowship that no one can shut, and he's tied them into his kingdom, which no one can conquer. Okay, so they are victorious, right? And that's what he's been saying. Name a city my God, and we will be victorious. And it's kind of cool as we wrap this one up. The last thing he says, Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the church of Philadelphia heard him. We can go back and we can look at some of these churches that heard him. And the church of Philadelphia heard him. Which means not that they had amazing opportunities, it's that they had relationship with God and they were tied to him in relationship and in victory and in kingdom. And this church lasted for centuries. The church at Philadelphia, even as what we call Turkey, became part of the Muslim empire, the church at Philadelphia lasted and lasted and lasted and lasted and lasted. We, we know it lasted at least to the mid-14th century. And possibly might even still be there today. Because they persevered to the end. Because there was an open door of fellowship with God that they, that they walked through and stayed there. And that Jesus had written his name of names, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, on them. Just like there's an open door before us that no one can shut. And we can have that relationship, that 
fellowship with God, and there is a name tattooed on us, King of King and Lord of Lords, because we belong to the one who is going to be ultimately victorious. That's kind of encouraging stuff, isn't it? <laughs> During some discouraging days, ah, Book of Revelation gives us some encouragement. That's today. We got, as I've said, we got a bunch of services Sunday at. Let me give you that. The, the, it, if you just want to remember it, it's SSC Living Room dot online dot church or you can just go to youtube and find us or to this place right on our church facebook page and you can watch we'll be at 9 10 11 in various places if you'd like to hear our service that'd be cool we'd love to have you and again we'll be meeting next week all week long well monday tuesday thursday friday and then the week after that we'll start on once a week on mondays at 11 30 okay thanks for thanks for tuning in we'll see you later all right have a great day bye